What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Save Show podcast with your host, Justin. This is a weekly updated audio and visual journal where you get to see me struggle real time to become a better husband, better man, better father, and certainly you'll see me as I grow closer in my relationship with God. If you want to support the show, please check out the saved.store. You'll find podcast episodes out there. Um, great if you could share it. Getting a lot of listens lately, so I appreciate the support in that regard. You can go to Instagram. Our link's up there. You can check out the reels that we're putting out there. Give us a follow. Definitely appreciate that. There's also the merchandise that I've created. Uh, got some great designs out there. Um, this shirt is actually one of them. Uh, our Wise as Serpents, Innocent as Doves t-shirt uh, that's up there to check out. So those are ways to support the show. Another way to support the show is just uh, sharing God with those around you. That would be great to see. Like I said, this is a guest episode with my friend Cole. I don't want to take up too much of the, the time here. I want to get into the conversation, so let's check it out. All right. We're here with the another Theopolitan Instagram page owner, Cole. Pleasure to meet you, sir, and uh, it's nice to finally see your face. Pleasure to meet you, man. Uh, really honored to be on the show. Looking forward to it. I've uh, been a fan for uh, not too, too long, but I'd say quite a few episodes under the belt. So I uh, really appreciate what you're doing, man. Appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. It's been fun. We, uh, well, I say we, it's mostly me. It's a one-man army kind of thing. I uh, do the marketing, do the Instagram page, do the the podcast, the production, everything. But uh, um, yeah, it's been a blessing this year to to grow and to put so many hours into one thing um, and develop skills and and actually have what I would consider more of a polished and, and good looking uh, presentation, you know, at this point. Um, but I, I would say likewise, you know, your Instagram page, what you're putting out there, um, articles, all the words that you're putting to, to content, to print as it were, um, is really edifying and uh, has helped me. So I'm, I'm glad to have you on. Awesome, man. Yeah, I know that's, that's the prayer. Um, so the, the page came about, uh, it was, it's kind of funny in hindsight, it was, I, the intention was just to do book reviews, uh, books that I've been reading that I was really excited about. Um, cause I wasn't, I did not grow up a reader. I actually despised reading, uh, only did it by obligation from courses and what have you. Um, but then when the Lord saved me, uh, and I was plugged into scripture, I was like, oh, I, okay. So I can get a lot out of reading and I actually really enjoyed it. And I just decided like, oh, actually, like if, it, if it's something that I really care about, then I can I can really turn some pages. Um, but then it just it, uh, exploded. And that's just in, right in line with my uh, testimony. Um, so I grew up the grandson of a Southern Baptist preacher. Okay. Um, so I grew up in a Christian home uh, in Louisiana. So it's you know very deep under the Bible belt where you could throw a rock and you'll hit somebody that's a baptized believer, right? Um, and so that was me. I was a cultural Christian by all means. Um, but I, but I'd like to be one, like, like to say I was one of those quote unquote, like thinking Christians where I had some issues with scripture and different things that I was being taught. But at the same time, I didn't really care enough to try to reconcile. It was more of like, I, I didn't know exactly what I believed, but I was sure of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was really put to the test when I got to college. Uh, now all the while, particularly in high school, I was living a double life of in the public eye. I was involved in ministries and all kinds of activities and clubs. I was sure. in a worship band. But then in my, in my personal life, I was partying, um, doing all kinds of things that my parents and uh, certain of my congregation would have been ashamed of. And I, I should have been, but I wasn't. Um, I get to college, um, went to the United States Naval Academy, um, which is, as many would anticipate, not a very friendly place to uh, uh, it's people of faith that doesn't necessarily foster spiritual growth, at least in the brochure. Right. Uh, but oddly enough, it was like the perfect little uh, capsule, if you will, to to push me to grow uh, in Christ, because you look around, and you're like, oh, shoot, like there's a lot going on. It's a lot. It's a it's a very weird college where there's uh, constantly a lot going on and you have to be very disciplined. And that actually showed me how weak I was. I was doing horrible in classes. Um, and my spiritual life, or at least how I perceived it, was in a pit. And I just knew that something was utterly wrong. Uh, but that was really ironically um, highlighted for me when I was I was participating in a college ministry, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ. We did a mission trip my sophomore year um, in Panama City Beach. And it was really eye-opening for me because it was the first time I was doing, you know, person-to-person 
evangelism. Sure. And I realized it was during spring break on the beach mm-hmm. in Florida. So it's, you know, literally going up to people that are partying and tell, trying to tell them about Jesus. And I realized, I was like, shoot, well, one, if I wasn't with this ministry group, like I'd be with them. Right. And that hit me because I realized like I have no right to try to tell this person to live a life that I'm not living. So then the second thing was, was like, oh, well, OK, well, wait, um, what am I trying to tell these people? And so that week also functioned as a uh, missions conference. And I realized the great I was I was told the great need of the gospel for the world, that there's still two billion people who've never seen a cross, never seen a church building, mm-hmm. things that we take for granted every day. Um, so the months that followed that. I was just torn up because I was like, what do I, what do I do with those convictions? Especially in the light of, I thought that I've been living this Christian life for over a decade. Mm -hmm. Um, What happened next was a just swan dive into reform theology. Um, My girlfriend at the time, she would soon become my fiance and then my wife. uh, I was staying with her and her family for, um, for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd been wrestling with all kinds of things in scripture that were really by this point I'd, I'd committed to reading scripture for the first time like all the way through and uh various questions about what actually happened on the cross i was dealing with um and like too i was also growing in my knowledge of the history of the church what the church has been facing in the last several decades um questions of you know what do we do about the prosperity gospel what do we do about secular humanism coming into the church and all these things finally climax when uh we were sitting there together we watched a documentary uh, called Calvinist. Now, in the the church that I grew up in, like anyone that claimed to be a Calvinist, like you didn't touch with a ten foot pole. In fact, I specifically remember uh, I asked about one family one time to my parents. They said, "Oh, they're Calvinists. Stay away from them." Yeah. So I just knew that that was a bad word. Like, don't don't go near those folks. Uh, but then in college, like again, as I after this this experience my sophomore year, I realized like, okay, I really like guys like Paul Washer, Body Bauckham, uh, John MacArthur, John Piper. What do they all have in common? Why do I like these guys? I go on Wikipedia, Calvinist theology. I was like, oh no, I have to stop listening to these guys. <laughs> so then I, uh, I watched this documentary and uh, there was a, a whole section on Romans 9. And I paused the TV and I look at my girlfriend and I was like, do you understand what this is saying? Like, how have I, I had led Bible studies in Romans that skipped over chapters 9 through 11 and it never occurred to me why that might be. Yeah. And, uh, so I asked her, I was like, do you understand what this is saying? She was like, yeah, it seems pretty clear to me. I was like, what, what do you mean? So I wrestled with that passage for like three days. And so finally I had to come to the conclusion, which will be a prominent theme, uh, I'm sure, in the discussion later in this episode of, do I trust scripture or not? Like, do I believe what it says right there on the page or do I not? Um, and clearly I folded. But then, and this is where I'll wrap up because this is where things really got got fast. Um, I then... Um, got connected with a reformed uh, pastor in my area near the academy. And he was like, he was, I was basically trying to tell him the things that I was learning, the things that I, I was really passionate about. And he was like, no, you need some, you need, he basically said to me in a very kind way, you need some discipleship. And so I went from that gateway reform stage to like off the deep end, uh, theopolitan theology is what I like to call it. Yeah. Um, and then, and, and that's where I was like, Oh shoot. Like I have a responsibility. Like I, like, the stuff that I've learned so far, like if I'm really convicted about it, like if I believe it's what, what is true about the word of God, then like we already know, like, you don't, you don't have to be reformed to look around at the church today in America and say, okay, we need some reforming. Right. But especially if I believe these convictions, like I've got to do something about it. And so then the page came about um, and grace be to God. Like I don't, it's, it's, it's his ship. I just happen to be amongst the crew. He's taken it where he wants. And I hope that, I could be a good steward of what he wants to do even in this next year. Awesome. Yeah. Like you said, before we started recording, you've got the, uh, the gift to gab. I, I appreciate, you know, the depth that you went to in, in such a, a brief time. Uh, I wanted to not interject certainly, cause I think um, you're on a roll and, and I want to make sure that you captured everything. Um, but just to take you back, Naval Academy, that's a big deal. Um, and you kind of skipped over it. <laughs> Um, so yeah. congratulations. That's awesome. That's no small thing. Thanks. Um, if anybody's listening to this, you know, I'm a Marine Corps veteran. It's, it's a totally different, um, class of, of, you know, military member that, that we're, we're speaking to here. Um, so I don't, I don't want to, uh, to deny you 
uh, or certainly let you skip over any any uh, you know uh, gratitude that that is earned um, by you, Cole, by by going through that. So thank you for doing that. Um, that's awesome. Um, and then I don't you you covered so many topics. I'm trying to think back on. Yeah, I'm sorry. What? That's what happens, man. <laughs> you ran through it. That was awesome. Um, I would say I I too grew up in a church, but it was more of the cultural Christianity until a certain point in my life. Um, and even now it feels like I, I could, you know, you've seen those memes where it's like a, 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 a iceberg and you just see the tip of it. Um, yep. and that's, that's like growing up and that's still how I feel some days where this is how much I, I know, or this is how I would summarize, you know, my, my Christian faith. And then there's still the depth below the the water line that I still need to get through. So there's um, eschatology and thinking about Calvinism, like you mentioned, and, and all these other things, post-mill, pre-millennialism, um, all these things to, to dive into. Um, and it doesn't feel overwhelming. It feels like a, a welcome challenge, something that God's, you know, leading me towards further understanding, further, you know, diving into scripture, like you mentioned, trying to understand more um, and certainly to be um, a better follower uh, every day. Um, but just to to pass it back to you, Cole, what what do you think about um, Calvinism, or where where do you find yourself uh, on that line? Oh boy, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you thought you thought I threw I flew through a, a lot before. Just wait, uh, <laughs> but I'll I'll go back and I'll say I appreciate the nod um, for the academy stuff, uh, and this is where and, and you'll know exactly what I mean, this is where the obligatory, like my, my personal views do not reflect the United States Navy and the you know, yeah, DOD, yeah. whatever, yeah, I throw yeah. that out there. Uh, but, but the reason why I say that is actually to the antithesis of, I'm sure that Lord willing, you and I will have plenty of discussions about uh, the, whether it's the service academies and the military at large, the Department of Defense right now. Um, I, I'm certainly convinced people need to be aware of what is going on, particularly mm -hmm. from the perspective of a Christian. Um, and I'm sure that we'll talk about the wokeness and the other things uh yeah maybe maybe, maybe now like part two you know we'll yeah month, so we can <laughs> that's it actually yeah. put some time to it um but i think yeah i just wanted to make sure it's not glossed over what what you you're doing um by serving is is no small thing um despite my own feelings about the military in general yeah. uh you know oh, when yeah. it comes to individuals there's certainly some great people out there i still know people that are in um, and what they're doing is is worthy of respect. So uh, that's why I wanted to mention it. No, yeah, I totally understand. That. I appreciate it, man. I'm looking forward to that too. So hopefully, we keeps keeps people on their toes. Like, oh shoot, they're gonna they're gonna open that <laughs> can too. But uh, so so here's the deal with Calvinism. So um, a lot of folks get very skittish for all kinds of reasons. Maybe they don't like the name. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said that he didn't believe in Calvinism. He just believed in biblical theology. Um, so uh, however we frame it, however we try to respond to people's concerns, I think when you assess, because because one of the things that I did, I, I didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to be a Calvinist. Um, right. I think it, obviously by the guidance of the spirit, I was I was combing through the scriptures. Um, and one of the things that I think we as evangel we as evangelicals uh, in particular uh, don't do nearly as well as some of the brothers, and sisters and other traditions is uh, we don't we don't know anything about church history. And I, uh, I recognized that one day, not even because I woke up with that question, but I woke up with the question of, okay, well, what distinctly uh, defines a Baptist as opposed to a Methodist or a Methodist to a Lutheran, um, which to a lot of guys, like they've, they've always been taught that this, it's always been a passion there. So like, oh yeah, well, here's why. But I realized, oh shoot, like, I don't really know. And other than this generic cultural Christianity of we, you know, admit, believe, confess in Lord Jesus Christ, like what 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 defines those things and it was in studying that um that i was kind of in a back doorway introduced to reform theology and i laughed at it i was like i would never believe that and then you know look who we are today and, I, and so i would <laughs> well, say for could, anyone who, oh sorry cool if you could just define uh you know reformed theology for anybody out there listening like in your own words what would that what would that be before you before you continue your thought yeah, of course. Yeah. So I, yeah, I was going to segue there. Um, I would say to anyone who's skittish, uh, simply like take a deep breath, study the history of the Protestant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> study the history of the, uh, of the development of Protestantism and you'll come to find that you're more Calvinist than you'd want to believe, even mm -hmm. if you're a quote unquote free will Baptist or anything else. Um, I'd also like to get off the board right off the bat that the whole house of cards of Calvinism, believe it or not, 
does not rest on election or predestination. It's merely a fruit of some of the things that John Calvin taught. So let's try to slowly proceed with caution through the uh, reformed theological door. Um, so, so people have heard of the Protestant Reformation, right? Kind of a big deal. Uh, produced, you know, one of the largest movements in the church we've ever seen in history. Um, and you got guys right off the bat, like Martin Luther and John Calvin, that come up with conversation. Now, the fruit of their labors delivered unto us that we still carry around with us today, things like the five solas, sola fide, sola gratia, sola Christus, uh, sola dio gloria, gloria um, and uh, sola scriptura. So basically, we are saved uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, uh, according to the scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. And so there's a lot of people who maybe they've never heard that Latin, but they're like, well, yeah, I agree with that. All right, good. All right, so let's let's keep moving. Uh, so then, you, so then we arrive to John Calvin. So John Calvin. So it's important to to take note that he himself did not create the quote unquote like infamous five points of Calvinism. That was a development, a model created by later disciples of the Synod of Dort. But to answer the question uh, most succinctly. The quote unquote five points of Calvinism, Calvinism are only dealing with soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. How is it that uh, man is saved? Um, and this was actually in response to uh, quote unquote Arminians, uh, followers of Jacobus Armin, uh, Arminius. And the, their response to that faulty soteriology is that man is totally depraved or unable to save himself because of our sin. Uh, we are not absolutely depraved and, and capable of doing any good. However, we are predisposed to desire that which is not good. And we are totally unable in ourselves to save ourselves. This is easily proved um, from Genesis to Revelation. Um, but we'll come back to that because for me, that was the, that was the easiest doctrine to um, conform with because mm -hmm. uh, that's always been my, my understanding of man's sin. Uh, but we'll, we'll come back to that because that's actually a doctrine that if you don't get that correct, uh, and this was actually the first book of Calvin's Institutes, where if you don't understand the self properly, you will not understand who God is properly. Uh, mm -hmm. But then the next doctrine is uh, the one that scares everyone, even though, again, it's not the whole house of cards. Unconditional election, the idea that in eternity past, God both foreknew and predestined, as it says in Romans 8, 28 through 30, um, those whom he would justify, not based on any merit in and of those individuals. There's nothing that I could have done. Uh, there's nothing that I will ever do that will that will earn God's love towards me. It was an eternity past. Why? Because it was on his son, who is the elect one. Therefore, those who are in Christ are in the elect one of Christ. That was how Calvin taught it. Uh, the next one, this, this is the house of cards. You're looking for the house of cards. This is it. The limited atonement or the definite or particular atonement. The idea that Christ really does save sinners. And in fact, he saves all for whom he died. So we can really believe Christ when he says in John 6 and in John 10, that those who the father had given him, he will not lose from his hand. And that's really, really important because if we start saying that Christ died for folks who are going to end up in hell, then Christ really isn't a savior. He's, he's kind of a savior. Um, it's like saying that he went to the grocery store bought a bunch of groceries and left half of them at the register. Um, there's a lot of ways in which an improper view of the atonement slanders the wisdom, power, love uh, of God. Um, so that is, so because the thing is, is it, if we understand the atonement properly, that um, Christ really has saved all for whom he died without exception, then the question goes, okay, well, whom are these people? What was the mechanism by which they were saved? And of course, that's where we go backwards to the unlimited or the unconditional uh, election and so on and so forth. Um, the last two doctrines, irresistible grace and the perseverance of the saints. Irresistible grace is the idea that um, those for whom God has determined to save Yahweh and, and all three persons has determined to save. He really will save. there's nothing that uh, there's nothing that think about this way. There's nothing that the prodigal could have done to, to avoid going home. He was always determined. He was always destined to go back home. Sure. Uh, we can, we can resist the grace of God. I can try to, I can try to, uh, thwart the plans of God all day long by my sin, but ultimately like, I'm not going to overpower the love of God to save me a lowly sinner if he has determined to do so. Um, in the same way, in the same way that there's plenty of miracles we see in the gospel by which Christ will have healed someone who 
didn't even know who he was and didn't know who he was afterwards either. Um, and then lastly, perseverance of the saints, the idea that those for whom Christ died, who he has set his seal on the Holy Spirit, they will persevere to the end, um, that they really will not uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit in them, mm. not by any of their own meritorious works will they endure, but, but because of the Holy Spirit in them, they will endure. Now, there's a lot more there about Calvinism and Reformed theology. And again, that's actually all just dealing with the doctrine of salvation. But to think that, <coughs> excuse me, but to think that Calvinism is only about the doctrine of salvation is to be but one grain of sand on the shore, the shore side of any beach, right? There's, there's so much to be said. B.B. Warfield, essentially, and I'm going to paraphrase him, but he said that the Calvinist is the man who, who sees God in everything, in history, in art, and uh, every blade of grass, um, the idea that God is sovereign over all things at, at all times, that is the centrality of it. Um, but the other wonderful fruits that have come out of Reformed theology, most notably, I would say, has been covenantal theology, understanding how is it that God even relates to humanity and what has that been like through history? What does it look like now? And what is he doing? Because in my view, if we don't understand that, then we're all just having a good time with our going to heaven cards and we might as well just sit around and be nice people until then. Cause that's, that's what it all must be about. But if we understand that God is actually trying to accomplish something in history, um, well, that changes things. I actually, now I have to act. <coughs> well, that's wild. You, uh, you definitely have educated me. Um, you'll see me doing this a lot, you know, as I listen, <laughs> I'm be a good listener. Um, like I said, a lot of the, way I would illustrate my faith or, or my testimony thus far um, as almost 30 years old is uh, it's just the tip of the iceberg. So all the things that you're you're walking through, um, definitely excited to learn about and to, to dig into um, more so. Um, and so I, I don't want to play devil's advocate, but what about what about the other side? What about people who disagree with Calvin, the the Arminianism? Ar Armin Arminianism? Yeah. Um, yeah, Arminianism. Yeah. Yeah. What 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 would they have to say to everything that you just laid out for us? Yeah. So so usually some common objections are <clears throat> things like, well, what about free will? And again, like I, I almost feel bad for the folks that ask that because again, you're you're focusing on such a small part of what was uh what has been comprehensive reform theology. Um, mm -hmm. that it would be like questioning a football player about why he's wearing you know, the kind of socks that he's wearing. It's like, sure, I guess that matters, but it's such a small part of the overall game of football, right? It would be kind of a silly question. Um, but with regard to the, the question of free will, um, I think that's actually more tied to the depravity doctrine um, than even the election. I'll tell why in a second. Um, but really, the problem is not man's free will. Usually what, what people don't understand when they ask that question is that they are presupposing there is a reality which can exist in which they as an independent person uh, can make a decision which is free from either glorifying God or glorifying sin. But there is none. There's no third party option. There's no third party alternative. You will either glorify um, or sin against God or you will glorify or depart from sin. Um, so really what folks are asking about is not free will, but free agency. Am I capable of making decisions free from coercion? And this is actu actually something that we can learn a lot from Martin Luther as opposed to Calvin. Of course, Calvin, we can go on and on about what he had to say about it. Uh, but Luther had wrote a work called uh, Bondage, Bondage of the Will, um, in which, here's the thing, I can make uh, decisions free from coercion in the sense of, let's say you and I are in a sandwich shop. Uh, I can make a decision without you standing there with a gun to my head saying, hey, you're going to get the pastrami, right? Although you could if you want, right? I mean, I would, I would get it at that point. I would <laughs> yield. Um, but at the end of the day, the sinner actually cannot make a decision free from coercion. Why is that? Because we are in bondage to our sin. Our sin uh, pushes us to crave that which departs from God. And this is actually really handled... Um, uh, uniquely by Paul in Romans 6 when he talks about either being a slave to sin or a slave to Christ. Um, but there is no, <clears throat> again, there is no departing from either of those paradigms. Um, so those are some of the, those are some of the things that people wrestle with. The, another way to handle it as well is let's go back to the sandwich shop. Let's say you're not there. It's just me. 
God really had ordained um, that, you know, I got the pastrami, right? But he ordained that I did so freely, which is the part which is, seems to be just out of reach of our comprehension. Um, but it's nothing more than what the text articulates about um, the Deuteronomy 29, 29, the, um, the hidden things belong to God, but the revealed things belong to us. So then the question is, is what has been revealed in scripture? When you go to passages like Romans 9, verses 11 through 23, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, uh, Romans 8, 28, 28 through 30, and we can go on and on and on. What you see is that God's comprehensive sovereignty is such um, that I can, can actually make decisions that are free from coercion, and yet he has ordained that. This comes in the second objection. People then say, okay, well, then that just makes God sound like some divine cosmic you know, puppet master, or I'm just a robot, right? But in saying so, we have not properly understood the creator creature divide. Now this, this, what I'm espousing, I cannot claim this comes from Cornel the work of Cornelius Van Til, who's the great reformed apologist, I would turn anyone to it's, it's been, that has been trans. This has been the part of biblical teaching that has quite literally transformed the way that I think. Um, but what he espoused is a proper understanding of the creature, uh, the creator creature divide. So we, we can't think of God as some giant in the corner of the room of this room who's just pushing me around to do what he wants me to do, right? And I don't have a say in it. Um, what we should understand him as is Shakespeare and Hamlet, right? Now, this is, this is espoused by another infamous guy, Doug Wilson, but I think it's a, a fantastic model. He said this, he said, um, so let me ask you a question. When Hamlet speaks in the play, right? Who's really speaking, Hamlet or Shakespeare? I would have to say Shakespeare. Is it not both? It could be both. I would say yeah. Shakespeare wrote the lines, you know, Hamlet's speaking them. Yeah. So, but we know that in real time, of course, like even if we were at the Globes Theater right now and we're seeing an actor portrayed as Hamlet, he's espousing the lines. We know to your point, Shakespeare really wrote them. So we could say that both really did. And yet, we also know that watching that play, Shakespeare wasn't staying behind the guy with a gun to his back saying, better say these words, right? Yeah. Um, now, usually when that illustration is given, folks rush to say, okay, but, you know, Hamlet's just a, you know, a, a fixture of imagination. He's a piece of fiction. You know, I'm a real living person. In other words, we go to rush to defend ourselves as opposed to saying, is God not a more capable author than Shakespeare? Hmm. And so that says a lot. This is what I was talking about earlier about how usually people's objections to free will or something like that, objection to the puppet master thing, it really speaks to our depravity, I think. We desire to be autonomous. Uh, that's going to come up in our discussion of eschatology. Uh, we desire to be free from the will of God. This goes all the way back to the garden. Mm -hmm. uh, half God really said, and you will be like God. Those have always drawn us. And so for me, when people have objections to reform theology, whether on the view of the atonement, of election, of covenantal theology, more times than not, it's, it's actually not about those doctrines. They have a flawed view of what is the estate of man. Mm -hmm. are, we, are we sick in need of healing, right? Are we, are we just uh, victims of our circumstance? Well, no, scripture couldn't be more clear to either of those things. We're actually dead in our trespasses and sins. The analogy is not that man is waiting in the waters of life and the gospel is a life preserver tossed out to him. And it's just up to him if he can just grab it. But if he doesn't, you know, it's his fault. You know, scripture tells us that we are actually dead at the bottom of the ocean. And until Christ calls us, we're not coming out of the grave any more than Lazarus would have had Christ not called him. Sure. Um, and so this is the centrality of the gospel in these teachings. Uh, but like I said, they've, they've literally changed the way that I think. And that's, that's why like, I'm passionate about it, because if Christians are actually going to be involved in the real world and time and space, uh, we've got to understand the most important thing is how is it that man is saved and, and for what, for what, and what are we saved from and what are we saved for? What are we saved for? Ah, I know, this is, yeah. So this is, a, this is a big question. Um, so I'm going to undermine my own statements, right? So typically when Christianity is pitched in, you know, the marketplace of ideas, it's presented as only and exclusively the meta narrative of redemption, which is by no means wrong. Let me get that out. That is not, that is not incorrect. 
What I mean by that is, is typically when a Christian is articulating to an unbeliever or maybe another brother, sister in Christ, we go through Genesis to Revelation about how the whole story revolves around Christ as to only be about man's salvation. Now, don't get me wrong, again, like how God is redeeming creation since the fall is certainly like among the central focuses of all of scripture. But something that I've, I've come to find and study is it's also, uh, the Lord is also concerned from Genesis to Revelation as uh, towards man's maturity, um, that which he seeks to do. Because the what we really need to ask is if the Lord was only concerned with a personal relationship with human beings, then then why the monkeys, why the waterfalls, why the beautiful landscape around us? The Lord could have created, as theologian James Jordan points out, uh, a flat plane of just him and human beings. And right when Adam and Eve sinned, Christ could have come back right then and there and, and whipped you do like we're saved, right? So clearly, while of course the Lord is concerned with saving his children, uh, he's also more so concerned about something else. And uh, what I've and I'm not alone in this, but what, what reform thinkers have come to establish is he's concerned with maturity, this flourishing of, of glory that is even beyond our comprehension of, of what he seeks to do with creation to demonstrate his glory. Um, so that's where we start getting into things like eschatology, or, you know, we can go into the weeds and talk about how have we seen that maturity since the garden, um, but that's really up to you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't want to spend, you know, our entire night um digging into the weeds i appreciate um walking through everything and like we said we're going to do part two maybe we can conquer more than just wokeness out there um to <laughs> whatever depths you would like um i think just to bring things back to I, I i don't know what to call it but just to bring it back to more of a generic uh conversation instead of um pursuing more reformed theology and, and calvinism um i don't think i don't think um calvinism arminianism um, eschatology, post and pre-mill. I don't think that you would say that any of those are necessarily uh, heretical. Um, I know that people do fight back and forth about them, but as far as, uh, I guess, a unifying statement, um, can we work together despite, you know, these differences that we have as believers to honor the the Great Commission to further Christ's kingdom um, and, and to, uh, well, to bring people into the fold and, and make sure that they know um, everything about Christ. Can we do that? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say that there's, there's two things to keep in mind with that proposition. I like to think that, I don't know if you've ever seen this kind of discipline from, uh, from parents of when, you know, maybe two little kids are fighting and with, you know, parents break them up and they said, you know what, you guys are going to get along. And then they force them to hold hands <laughs> <laughs> and just for, for however long, if you ever, I don't know if you've ever seen anything yeah, like that. Definitely. And so, so we've been having this this debate, at least particularly Arminianism versus Calvinism for the last 500 years, and God has done precisely that. He said, you know what, you two are just got to get along, and he's uh, put our hands together. Um, but in saying that, um, we, we, we dive into a deeper philosophical question uh, with regard to God's sovereignty. Why has he allowed so many different denominations, traditions, uh, so many different perspectives of theology from the same book, right, from the same text of books that is the same meta narrative that would be a whole another episode but the gist of what you're looking for the uh, the unifying statement is this is like do we really and this will tie all all theological subjects together do we really believe christ is king or not it comes down to that and in light of that truth what are we going to do about it because if we don't do anything about it then he's really not king um so i'm all about the action let's get to the action uh and so we can continue talking about that yeah, I'd love to. I, uh, you say Christ is King and, uh, yeah. and, <laughs> and there it is yes, sir. The snapback, but, uh, but yeah, I want to have you back on. Um, I know today was a deep dive in some regards and, uh, I'm trying to pull back on the reins so we can push out a digestible, uh, episode for people on their, you know, their morning commute. It's kind of the, the, the organization we have here. Maybe one day we'll be into the Joe Rogan, you know, four hour, four hour episodes. <laughs> Um, I'd love to have you Insane. in an actual studio. That'd be cool. Um, but for now, you know, I'm working out of my basement and I see, I think you're at a kitchen table and, uh, and yeah. Yeah, you're we're, not talking wrong. About, we're talking about Christianity and, and trying to further, you know, Christ's kingdom. Certainly I'd agree with that statement. Christ is King. Um, and I appreciate you coming on and, and everything that you're imparting. Um, like I told you, I'm definitely being educated now. I've, I've, 
uh, had on a few guests, but none uh, more so in depth into um, belief as I as tonight. So um, it's not a whole lot of me talking. It's a lot of me doing this, um, but that's just because I'm, I'm learning and uh, and I appreciate uh, learning from a fellow believer um, and a brother in Christ. Um, so I I, uh, I I really appreciate it. I don't know how else to say that, but uh, but I'm feeling it, um, and I I do appreciate you coming on. Of course, man. Thank you. And uh, like I said, your what you're doing so far in your ministry has been a blessing to not just me, but I know all kinds of people. Um, and to that end, and yeah, Christ is getting the glory. Uh, and so thank you so much, man. Yeah. Yeah. We'll keep putting out reels. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in. I'll talk later. And with that, our conversation with another Theopolitan, with Cole, has come to an end. I hope you guys learned something from the conversation. I certainly did. Um, there's plenty that I need to read up on, search more. Uh, but ultimately, at the end of the day, um, I believe I'm, I'm following Christ, and, and that's what's important to me. Um, and that's the relationship that I'm trying to, to foster. So seeking knowledge, seeking understanding, and most importantly, I'm seeking seeking God in what I do. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Uh, love to have Cole on again. This is more of a part one. Um, that's what most of these guest episodes feel like anyways. You get a little bit of an intro, you get to know a person, and then um, and then we call it because it's, it's past our time. Um, but great conversation. Tons to learn uh, from my own edification, from my own understanding. Um, and I hope you guys liked it. Let me know if you want Cole to come back for part two. Uh, with that, I'll say God loves you. I love you. God bless you. Check out the saved.store and don't forget you are saved through Christ. Mm-hmm.